Already, welcome everybody. So my name is Sri Ram Kalyan Sundaram. I'm director of implementations at Tesora. So we are going to talk today. I just discuss today about uh, the topic is best practices for deploying OpenStack Tro, and uh, we are going to go through that. Wait for the last minute stragglers to get comfortable. Already. So like I said, I'm. Um, Sri Ram Kalyan Sundaram, Director of Implementations at Tesora. I work with customers as well as people that would like to know more about our product and what Trove does and things like that. Um, you know, uh, Trove has been around for a while and, 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 and we'll talk about it. Um, when, I, when I put together this chapter, so I, I had offered two courses. One is an advanced course on tuning Trove as well as this one. And uh, luckily, I guess this one got accepted. So what I would like to do here is intro to Trove. And as part of this, I would like to provide uh, people that are interested. I have around 20, 25 or so thumb drives that contains a, a full dev stack plus the latest version of, of Trove. If you want to try it out on your, on your laptop or something like that, you can definitely do that. I'm happy to provide that to you. Uh, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a small demo and then, and then take on questions. We, are, we have a booth here, and we have, we have been talking to a bunch of people, and we find that while some of the uh, folks understand Tro very well, there are a lot of people that don't understand DBAS and what does it do and things like that. Given the fact it is a, it's an introductory session, a beginner session, it makes sense to talk about Tro, what does it do, uh, show you what it does before talking about the best practices, right? So we are going to talk about what is Tro, how does it work, just quickly show you how, it, how we can see it in action, and then go into architecture, and then talk about you know, the best practices or what is the best way to deploy it in a POC environment to kind of test out your, your use cases and scenarios, followed by how, do you, how, would, how have some folks deployed that in production, right? And I see I only have 40 minutes for this session, so what I would request is that we will bucket some time for questions and we'll leave it at the end. That way we can cover the materials, have your questions ready, and we can go through them at the end. Okay? Okay? So, so what is Trove? And once again, uh, to make sure everybody is on the same page, right? So Trove is a, a project like any other project, Cinder, Swift, Nova, Glance, Keystone, right? Trove is a project uh, that is designed to provide databases as a service. It came up in Havana, it's 2013, so it's uh, three years ago, and then it got integrated in ISOs. So for the last two and a half years or thereabouts, it's been part of um, OpenStack. Just a quick background, HP and Rackspace started it, but now if you look at the latest commits on Stack Analytics, you will see Tesora. I work for Tesora, we're the last, largest contributors to the Trove project, but we have Rackspace, HP, IBM, Red Hat, and a bunch of folks that are doing it. And by the way, I believe uh, this, there's a video being taken of this, and you can get it in a couple of days from the OpenStack website, and I'm happy to share. As part of the thumb drive, I will have a PDF of this presentation, too, in case you're interested. So if you, if you say Trove is database as a service, what do you really get with it, right? So for those folks that are familiar with the Amazon RDS, I'm just trying to draw a parallel so it's easier to understand, right? So there is a whole bunch of databases that you can easily provision with Trove. Trove does a complete life cycle of that. So for example, if you have a bunch of developers in your organization and they're saying, hey, you know what? For my applications, I need, I need databases, but um, I need to use a variety of databases and I don't know all the databases and how they work, so how do I go about creating and using those databases, and that's where, and that's where Trove comes in. So using Trove, uh, you can spin up both um, SQL as well as NoSQL databases. So if you talk about it, there's a slide that talks about the databases that are being supported, but you can have a MySQL, Oracle, or a Postgres. On the same hand, you can have Cassandra, Mongo, Couchbase, and the like. And the idea is that it provides the same interface to access all the databases. So you don't need to learn different ways of accessing different databases. If you learn how to use, for example, a MySQL or a Postgres or a Mongo, that's the same way you access any other database. That is a cool thing about Trove. And in addition, it provides a complete lifecycle management. 
what does it mean? It basically means that Trove handles through the command line or the GUI all the way from creating a single instance or a replicated pair or replicated pairs, if you will, or a cluster, growing a single instance, shrinking a cluster, growing a cluster, uh, backing up, restoring, failover, uh, multi-DC support, monitoring, automated patching, it does all of that. So if you are a developer, if you are, if you are a DBA, it makes your life very easy in managing a bunch of databases, keep them all up to your company's InfoSec standards. If you are a developer, you just want to go through GUI, just like you get compute, just like you set up networking, if you just want to set up a bunch of databases, use them, throw them away, take backups, take snapshots, you can do all of that. Like I said, so these are all the databases that are available as of, as of right now. Uh, if you look on the column on the left-hand side, these are the community databases, MySQL, the different flavors of it, Percona, uh, MariaDB, Mongo, Cassandra, Couch, Redis. And then on the, on the right-hand side are the commercial databases. So uh, given the fact they, are, they have license behind them, they are not available as part of the community OpenStack Trove. I kind of talked about the, the complete lifecycle management, right? I kind of touched upon it a little bit, just to kind of go over that. Um, when you create a database, it's not enough that you, you know, create, scale up and scale down. There's a whole bunch of things that goes with how do you use a database, especially when you talk about using a database in a, uh, uh, in a, in a QA or in a production environment, right? So you want to be able to uh, create databases, single instances, or clusters. And once you do that, um, you obviously, when you, I have talked to a number of people, they say, hey, you know what, I have a chef script or a puppet script. You know, how was Trove different from that? I mean, I can approach on a database. Sure, you can. I think the thing to keep in mind is that not only do you want to create databases, but if you want to say things like, uh, if you want to manage them, then once you create a database, you have the, the database instance, the database server, if you will. Right, you want to be able to create within that instance, the server, a variety of databases, variety of users, schemas, and then once you do that, you want to be able to take backups, restore that backup, take schema snapshot and all of that, right? So that is part of carrying and feeding of the database, right? So you can do that once again using a command line or using a graphical interface, you can do that with Throw. And then once you have a database up and running, especially in a, in a production setting, you want to be able to tune Right? So Trove provides databases with a standard set of parameters that you can use, but every company that I work with, I know that they have their own standards for maintaining those databases. So how do you do that? So Trove provides you all the default parameters for every database. You can further add to them or refine them if you want to. That's number one. Number two is that you can say, I want to take a small set of those parameters and I want to tune them. So you can use Trove to do that. And also, you know, you have APIs for custom configurations, right? That's, that's pretty powerful. And if you are talking about uh, monitoring, and every, everybody that I talk to these days say that, hey, you know what, it's great to have a database, it's great to have them up and running to scale up, scale down, how do I monitor that? And when you talk about, okay, we support monitoring, then the question comes is, company A says I have monitoring tool A, company B says I'm monitoring tool B, and so on and so forth. So what Trove has done the community is um, there's a feature called module management and using that you can use any monitoring tool that you want and you can deploy that as part of Trove. So you don't have to be forced into anything that you want. As long as you have a plugin for that monitoring tool, there you go. You can use Trove and you can collect the data and you can do whatever you want to do with it. And from a security perspective, Trove doesn't let you, Trove lets you access a database instance only through the public interface, which basically means that you can't, if it's a MySQL, you can use it using the MySQL interface, and if it's Mongo or Cassandra through that, you can't really SSH into the instance. It's, it makes it very, very secure. And another part of security is that when we talk to customers, the question is, you know, um, Whichever way you create your images, we provide images as part of Tesora, but if you choose to use the community Trove, we are part of the community here, you can create your own guest images. And if that is the case, um, how do you make sure if the Linux vendor has a patch or the database vendor has a patch, uh, how do you make sure that you keep your instances running 
up to date with all those patches, right? So there is a functionality where you can update one instances or you can create a simple script that you can update all running instances of a particular database type with the latest uh, patch version. So that is pretty powerful. So not only can you create databases, create clusters, grow, shrink them, that's standard stuff, but you can care and feed it, backup, you can tune, you can secure, and you can monitor and you can make sure it stays up to date. Some, some, some basic terminology as we kind of go through the architecture and things like that. So most people here, or if not everyone, is familiar with the concept of an image, right? So we have, you know, you, you spin up a Nova instance, you can say, okay, that Nova instance should contain a particular operating system image, right? And then that comes up with that. In the corresponding way, you have a Trove guest image. The Trove guest image consists of three parts. It contains the Linux flavor, if you want to use CentOS or Ubuntu or whatever else. Now you can you can create one. It, the second part is the database software itself, and the third part is the is a Trove guest agent code. So those three things: the the Linux operating system, the database software, and the Trove guest agent. Uh, all three things um, combine uh, to be part of to be part of a Trove guest image. And then Trove guest agent. Trove guest agent is the piece of code that you use that can actually interact with the database. Now, I said earlier, whether you're using Mongo or, or Oracle or, or MySQL, it works the same way. How is it possible? Because each database operates differently, right? The way it is is there's a concept of a Trove guest agent. And what it does is, for lack of a better term, it's a translation layer. So it takes your standard Trove commands, like a Trove create, and what it does is it translates that to corresponding create for the database that you are that you are dealing with obviously there's a lot more things than that but that's a general principle it translates your your trove command to the actual database commands the trove instance i say i keep using the word instance instance is basically uh, a running compute instance or a compute instances if you're talking about a cluster um, that comprises you know your database servers or data single database server a cluster is a cluster. Data store, I mean, I use the word, before I get into data store, I use the word database type. So within Trove terminology, if you say a database type, you know, I have Oracle, MySQL, Postgres, and Cassandra. So each one of those things, the database type is called a data store. And remember, I, I kind of talked about upgrading within uh, different versions. So Trove also knows about a data store version. So you can say I have MySQL 5.6, I have Oracle 11, Oracle 12, Mongo, 3.0, Mongo 3.2, so all those things are, are data store versions. A configuration group is a, a grouping of parameters that you can use to kind of tune your, uh, your running database. And, uh, and most of you should know flavor. It, just like it, it's the same Nova flavor, you can use the various Nova flavors you have created to spin up or like to, to kind of go up or go down if you want to your, uh, your Trove instance. And before I quickly show you how Tro works, some, 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 some basic things. Um, just like any other OpenStack service, when you create a database instance, you can either do it through a command line or, or a graphical user interface. And you can do basically, you have, you have full flavor support. So if you can say you're starting with a you know, M1 large or M1 extra large, then you can keep going up or you know, go down. Uh, you have Cinder volume support, so you can start with a small volume and you can keep increasing the size as your database needs grow. You can, using the Trove API, create databases, users, and create backup and restore from the backup. What I want to do is, once again, I, I find when I'm on the booth, a lot of people are coming and saying, okay, what do you do? What does, what does Trove do? Database as a service, how does, it, how does it work? How do you touch, feel it, right? So uh, probably just spend just a couple of minutes, just quickly show you how it looks how it looks in the UI. A number of you, if not all of you, would be familiar with the Horizon interface for, for OpenStack, but you may not have used the, the Trove plugin inside that. So, so when we talk about deployment methodology and how we do in POC and production, hopefully this would help you understand that better.
So basically, if you if you if you look at it, if you look at it when you when you, when you deploy um, tro, okay. When 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 you deploy tro, this is basically when you deploy the tro plugin, uh, community tro, let's say, right? So you get you get all of these things in there. You get you get you get instances. Backups, clusters, data stores, configuration groups, and replication topology. Right, replication topology. Basically, if you create a master slave, if you want to just look at those master slave instances, you can click on that, and you would see that. And I'm going to show you how you create a single MySQL instance, take a backup, and then create how to create a Mongo, Mongo cluster. So if to create a new instance, just like Nova Compute, you go to launch instance, and out comes this, out comes this window, and you can basically enter the information you want. If you have, now with databases, it's slightly different, right? You can have different databases in different hypervisors or availability zones. So let's say that you, know, you have um, a database in one availability zone. You want to have other databases in different availability zones to kind of protect yourself. So if you want to, Trove, Trove supports that. You can basically specify the availability zone that you want. And you can specify the instance name. That's no different than how you create a compute instance. Specify from a database perspective, specify how big your database is. At least the starting value is you can specify the data store, which is um, the different databases that are available, right? So even though I showed a list of 16 databases, if you take into account the commercial versions, right, you can pick and choose what you want to provide your, your developers, right? You, can, you may want to enable only five or six. So those five or six is available here. And same thing in the flavor, right? Depending on what flavors you create, you can do that. One thing Trove does is you can say, if you're interested to get into that, is to say, you know, if you have a Mongo database or a Cassandra, you may want to provide it a, an SSD-based one, whereas for a MySQL, just provide a regular spinning disk. If you want to filter it based on it, you can do that using Trove. I mean, Trove has come a long way in the last three, four years based on customer feedback, so it's pretty good. And, the, and, then the, and then the same thing, if you want to say, you know, only specific flavors for specific database types, that is something you can do. Obviously, this first screen lets you pick and choose what, how you want to customize your, your database instance or the database server. The other thing is, when you create your database instance, you can also, at the same time, for the databases that allow it, create a database and a user to operate on that. By default, Trove doesn't create a root user. It's basically you have to create database instances, and on those instances, you create users with, with passwords. So, so basically what you can do is you can create a user and a password, and then you can provide them the endpoint. And what happens is that when you connect to the database, you have a database name and a user and a password, and you can use that to, to connect to that. And obviously, if you choose to create a database instance without um, a, uh, without a user or password, you can always go back in and, and add it at a later stage. And you can have any number of, depending on how big your, uh, your flavor is, you can add any number of databases and, and, and users. And obviously, uh, Trove creates the, the database instance in the user's tenant. And then, and then once you do that, it, if you look at, if you inspect the instance, either through the CLI or through the GUI, uh, you you are also presented the the connection string. So if you have developers that are using it, you, all you need to do is provide them the connection string. And even if they don't have access to the to the to the GUI or the CLI, they can still connect to the database as if you created it by by hand. And this this tab, the default tab, is what I'm talking about. This is basically it it, it allows you to list out or make available all the properties for a given database type or a data store. So different data stores have different properties. And what Trove does, it, it gives you access to all those things. And if you want, as, a, as an organization, you can say, enable all these properties for all my developers. Or you can say, take a subset of this, um, give it to only my DBAs can access it. The other subset, my regular users can access it. You can add more to it. You can take away from it. It's up to you. You have flexibility. Out of the box comes a number of properties, and you can pick and choose. The other thing that, uh, that Trove supports is the concept of logs. Remember I said earlier that you cannot SSH into the instance, right? So 
a number of you that have used databases in the past, you have you install you 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 launch a compute instance, you SSH into it, you download the database software, you set it up, and then you run it. And if you say, hey, something is go something is going wrong, you want to go figure out what what it is, you SSH back into it again. You go and look at the logs. But if you can't SSH into the log into the instance, how do you get the logs? So what Trove does is it exports the logs to you, once again through CLI or through Horizon, right? So it, if, since we're looking at a MySQL instance, it provides all the MySQL logs that you care about. In addition to that, the Trove guest log that, that basically says what is happening from a Trove perspective. You can publish these logs anytime you want. If you, if you want to enable or disable a log, once again, you can do that. But, but the net net is everything that you want to do with the database server or a database instance, you can do, do it through the GUI or through the command line. It makes your life a lot easier. And you know that um, by, by mistake, you cannot do something that would cause problems to the database instance, right? Because it's all done through this. Um, there's not much damage you can, you can cause other than, just, other than just use it. The, um, there are a number of things that this demo is there, but given the time constraints, I'm just going to focus on you know, some of the simple things that you can do. Um, if you look at it, these are all the things that you can do. You can, you, you can upgrade the instance. You can schedule backups. You can attach configuration groups. If you want to create a root user, you can. Resize instance, resize volume. But if you want to take a backup, it's pretty simple. You can, you can very easily do a backup by, by clicking on Create Backup. Basically, creating a backup is pretty simple. Uh, what happens is, just like you do create instance, you can give it a name and, uh, and what database instance you want to take a backup. It takes a backup. And then the way Trove works is that, obviously, the database server instance is created using a Nova instance. And then the database itself, the, ba uh, the, the data in the database is stored in a Cinder volume, right? Now, the backups are not stored in Cinder. So what happens is that when you say take a backup, whatever approach you have, depending on the database type that you take the backup in, the backup data gets taken. And then if the database type allows for streaming backup, the backup is streamed. Otherwise, you take a local copy and then you move it. But the net net is the data gets taken, the backup is taken from Cinder volume and stored in Swift. So for, for Trove, one of the requirements if you want to use backups is, is basically you need to have Swift enabled. So um, you take a backup, you store it in Swift. Then you have the ability to look at all the backups. And because the backups are stored in Swift, when you delete a database instance, the compute is gone, so is the Cinder volume, but the backups are still there. So the net net is you may create some database in the past. You can do some development work. You can take some backups. And then if you want to delete those instances, but you still want to go back to the schema or the initial things you had created, you can always go back to that, and you can use it to restore and create a, create a new database. Now, we kind of looked at it just a, a, a small exposure to how we create a single instance and a volume. What I want to do is also um, just slightly different way um, to say Mongo cluster, right? So remember I said it works the same way, whether it is a MySQL or a Mongo or a Postgres or Oracle. So if you want to go through clusters, so just like launch instance, you click on launch cluster. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Mongo cluster, but basically you can just provide the name, um, the, the data store, which is in this case a MongoDB, um, a, the flavor, the volume size. And Mongo works in a slight way. Basically, the Mongo data, when you talk about cluster, you have, you, there are a number of shards, and each shard has got a replica set. So basically, what you can do directly using Trove is basically you can create the Mongo shards and replica sets in a single operation. You basically say how many, how many you need. And then what happens is, in this case, I've chosen one shard and three replica set instances, right? So basically, if you look at it, it is a, it's a, a compute instance of one gig RAM, right? It basically, there are, there are three instances. Obviously, given the fact it's a video, it runs really fast. In real life, it'll probably take a little bit more than that. But if you go take a look at the Mongo cluster, you would see that the cluster is there, and also um, the instances are instances are there. Um, but 
the good thing is from a true perspective you can deal with it as a as a as a cluster you can grow the cluster you can you can shrink the cluster as a cluster as opposed to a single single instance and if you uh, take a look at the compute tab um, then you can see that the actual cluster instances uh, are there those three instances are there and in addition uh, trove takes care of the for those folks that know about mongo mongo has a concept of a query router and config server so it creates all of those things behind the scene for you. But take up it this way. I've spoken to a number of customers. They say, hey, you know what? Single instances are easier. If I'm going to create clusters, I've got to go back and spin up all those instances, set up the networking, set up, download the software for every single thing that I want. It's pretty painful. If you go to the community, get the trove, deploy it, then you know, with, with just one command line using your CLI or through the GUI, you can very easily create however big a cluster you want. But more importantly, you don't have to worry about the details of how you, uh, how you grow or how you uh, shrink. So if you, want to, if you want to grow the cluster, it's pretty simple. If you want to shrink it, it's pretty simple. If you want to grow the cluster, all you would need to do is um, you know, click on Grow Cluster, Add Instance, and you can basically add new data instances, new query routers, new config servers. It's, it's, it's pretty easy. And I, I just wanted to do that, show that to you so that you have a sense of um, what exactly, you know, how does, how does Trove work? Because that's one thing I hear all the time. What is DBAS? How does it work? So for those folks in the audience, if you haven't, if you are not familiar with Trove, you may have seen RD as an action, but if you, if you haven't seen Trove, hopefully this gives you a sense of single instance backup cluster, how does it do? Like I said, Trove does a lot more things and it's very easy. Go to the U, GUI, click it, and, uh, and you can use it. And then coming back to the main topic, which is the best practices, right? How does how does Trove work? If you let's first look at the basic Trove architecture, right? So when you look at a Trove database architecture, this is the way it is. If and uh, it is very similar to other other uh, OpenStack services. So it basically has got a API service, it's got a conductor service, it's got a, it's got a task manager, and in addition, it needs a message bus and a uh, and a metadata database for the for the operations, and the picture on the screen is it's kind it kind of contains two boxes, right? So there is a there is a there is a box which is the which is the OpenStack box, and if you look at it, it's got the OpenStack services, right? It's got the compute Cinder, it's got Swift for the backup, it's got Glance for the database images. So if you have in so far in the demo, we saw Mongo and MySQL. So if you have a Mongo and MySQL, those two images would be stored in the in, in Glance, and then you have Neutron and Keystone, right? So basic OpenStack services. And in addition to the, to the box on the left, you see the Trove API, Trove Task Manager, and the Trove Conductor. The, when you deploy Trove, let's say you go to community, you grab the Trove, you deploy Trove, you get those three services. And the Trove API is the service that you work with the where you say, you know, Trove Create, Trove Backup, Trove Delete, Trove Grow, Trove Shrink, whatever, right? That's the one that handles that. And then basically it uses the, the message bus um, to kind of pass the messages on. And then Task Manager is the one, similar to other services, that does the bulk of the work. So it takes all the work and then communicates with the different things. So for example, if you're gonna say, you know, create a MySQL database in a particular flavor, uh, particular Cinder volume, things like that, um, you need to make sure because the folks here understand the access a user has within OpenStack is governed by their, their tenant quota, right? So if you, if you have only so much tenant quota and if you keep creating instances, it's going to eat into that quota. So you want to make sure, or rather True wants to make sure that you have the resources to, to do that. So when you say create, the task manager makes sure that all those resources are available and if they are if they're available, it continues to create it. If not, you get an error. And then the last one is the uh, is the trove conductor. And the trove conductor basically, if you have running instances, if there are things going on, it goes through the conductor, through the message bus, into the log. Each of those three services, API, task manager, and conductor, have a particular log. And if you want, it is it is on the trove controller. So if you want to look at it, um, you know you can go back and look at those logs to see to see what's going on to see what's going on. 
And then talking about best practices, we have had a chance to work with a number of customers, large companies and small companies, and uh, and they they all want to try out throw inside their OpenStack environment and see and see how it works. And like I said, I'll be I have a few um, thumb drives, 30 gig thumb drives that contains a dev stack and a and a Tesora environment in their a, a Trove environment. So if you want to deploy it, so typically this is what a POC configuration would look like and based on best practices, right? So you have your you have your open stack here. So you may set up your open stack in 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 HA. And your open stack you you may have once again your RabbitMQ in HA and you may have your infrastructure DB and typically it's MySQL, right? So you have your open stack, it's all right here. Everything in HA, right? Now from a from a Trove perspective, you may want to keep it as part of it or you may want to keep it isolated. So what we have seen customers do is that you can spin up a Nova instance and you can grab Trove and you can, and you can um, deploy it in there. So Trove strictly runs as part of your, uh, your Nova environment, right? You spin it up, you, you put it in there. And if you look at the picture earlier, Trove needs a, uh, a metadata database and a message bus uh, you have you have you have two options. You can either say throw use the MySQL database that your OpenStack uses, or you can say throw use the RabbitMQ that is um, that is part of that. Or because you're doing a POC sample environment, what you can do is you can basically say uh, you can create your own RabbitMQ and a and a metadata database just for your POC so that you don't touch your main um, you know. Um, a rabbit MQ or, or, or things. So many, many times when we work with uh, folks that want to try it out, they're, they're admins and maybe there are some OpenStack admins here that you don't want to let people t use the main rabbit MQ or meta metadata database. If that is the case, you can choose to have your own rabbit MQ or your own My MySQL database and all you need to do is tell throw, here is where it is and you can use it, right? And obviously, you have, a, you have a number of tenants. And what happens is when you say create a Trove service, uh, that tenant has access to both the Trove management network as well as a tenant-specific network. So all you would need to do is, from your perspective, if you want to try Trove out, basically spin up a, spin up a uh, virtual machine. All you need to do is go to your OpenStack, spin up a Nova instance of sufficient um, size, like a large or whatever it is, extra large deploy Trove in there, and then um, have it, have your own RabbitMQ, and have your own um, uh, uh, MySQL database just for the purposes of Trove, and you can use it. And once your POC is done, you can kind of clean it out, so it makes, it makes your life a lot easier. And we have some customers that are using it. Cisco is one of them. When I, I did a similar presentation, in Austin, and the folks from Cisco were there that kind of worked with us, and we kind of talked about it. I wanted to kind of talk about how we talked about the POC environment, which is pretty simple. When you talk about production, it's a lot more complicated, right? So, if you if you if you look at it, you can you can have a a within within OpenStack region, you can have a service cloud where you can have your Trove services in HA, and you can have your OpenStack services, and, and what you can do is, this is the way they have done it, but you can choose to do it in a different way, but basically they put, they had a separate tenant cloud, and they put their instances in there, so when instances get created, those instances get created in the tenant cloud, the advantage is that um, if, you are, if you are a single enterprise, like a number of customers are, it's not an issue, but if you are providing services to a number of groups, then by putting it in a separate cloud, what it does is the OpenStack operator doesn't have access to that. Only your, your own group has got access to those instances. And only if you want to provide your OpenStack admin access to that, you can enable um, that access so they can go back and look at their instances. It's, it's, you can either put it in the same cloud where they have access, or if you want to really segregate that, this is one option. They have done it that way. It is something you can uh, you can look into it and see if this is something that you want to do. 
this kind of interesting, it works for them, something to keep in mind, right? So, and obviously you need the message bus to communicate back and forth, and the message bus is in a, is in a, is in a DMZ. And if you're looking at, okay, great, how do I deploy Trove in an HA configuration, right? Because when you're talking about a POC, you can say, okay, you know what, I want to deploy Trove in a, 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 a NOVA instance of sufficient size. I can create a bunch of uh, Trove services to use them, but in a production setup, or even in a staging setup, you want to have Trove in an HA configuration, right? So in an HA configuration, what you can do is basically you can have one way of doing it. I'm not saying this is the way everybody does it. I know a number of customers do it this way in production. You can, you can definitely do it this way. You can have a, uh, a load balancer in their HA proxy, and you can have Trove services, basically a number of virtual machines or physical machines running that has all the three Trove services, right? The API, task manager, and conductor, all, all running there, standing behind a HA proxy. And correspondingly, for the metadata database, you have, you, have, you have two options. Once you go to production, once your organization has said, hey, you know what? We tried Trove out. We did it in staging. Everything seems to work fine. We can put it in production. Because at that time, Trove could be a first class application, right? So your, your IT teams would let you store the Trove data, access Trove uh, with the main metadata database or your main RabbitMQ. If that is the case, you can use that. But if you decide you want to still keep it separate, then for your um, metadata database, the MySQL database, you can put a, as an example, a Galera cluster, and you can put it inside a, behind a HA proxy load balancer. And RabbitMQ, once again, you can set up a number of RabbitMQ uh, instances. And you don't really need to do an HA proxy in there. I think there is. It may have been resolved right now. There were some issues with the RabbitMQ and HA proxy. So what you can do is, in a RabbitMQ configuration, you can specify all the servers it's running in, so it handles um, ha handles that internally. So you can just do it that way. Meaning, set up your Trove services in um, multiple Trove services. Put it behind a HA proxy. Put a put your metadata database in a uh, Galera cluster or something like that behind an HA proxy and set up a number of RabbitMQ instances and have it work that way. So POC, spin up a Nova instance, put it all in there, use it for your testing, production, staging, put it in an HA setup, and do it this way. There are other ways of configuring Trove, but I just wanted to give you a sense of what has worked for other customers in real life. And if you're willing to try that, this is something that will definitely work for you. And there were some requests saying, hey, you know what? Uh, Trove is there in every every cycle. New features are coming in there. What is coming in, coming in Newton? So basically, in the Newton, there is this upgrade support. So if you have if you have patches that for your Ubuntu or CentOS or Red Hat or whatever Linux systems you have, or for the databases themselves, if you have uh, bug fixes and things like that, and you want to upgrade things with that, so there is upgrade support. There is more usability improvements, like I I showed you grouping of master replicated pairs in there, so things like that in there. There is clustering improvements, more clusters being supported. Uh, and then there is, uh, I didn't really get into it, but basically I, we talked about availability zones. You can basically say that when you create a master-slave pair, you can put the master in one availability zone, the slave in another availability zone. Now, if you look at OpenStack, when you create your AZs, it has a tie into your um, hypervisors, right? So that way, what you can make sure is that the master and the slave are in two separate hypervisors. So if one of them goes down, the other one is still available, right? So that is something you can do. And there is better PostgreSQL support from the community. And same thing with DB2 Express. I don't know how many of you are interested in DB2, but if you are, you know, you have uh, better support. And same thing is there were, there were some issues, I believe, with the Coda management. Um, and then there is, they have fixed it so that it's easier to, easier to do that. And obviously, I'm not spending too much time on these points in greater details. But if you want to know more about the specific features, what is being done in Newton, and what is going to come in uh, uh, further down in Okata, then there is a session by the Trove PTL uh, tomorrow at 150 in 117th. 
I guess somewhere here, or maybe in P2. Um, so basically it talks about what is coming there in OpenStack, uh, Newton, and then in, uh, in Wakata. Wow. We have five to 10 minutes of time available, so I'm happy to answer any and all questions. So there is a microphone there. I think uh, if you could do that, everybody can hear it, plus it's going to get recorded in there. Um, I have a question. And, sure. Um, can I use heat to deploy databases? Not, not right now. I mean, you can use heat, but Trove does not use heat. Trove uses its own. So if you have your own heat script, maybe you can use that. But Trove doesn't support heat right now. OK. And uh, can I grant access to databases through security groups? Yeah, so when you create a database instance, a security group gets created. Out of the box, what happens is only the, the ports that are needed are enabled, but you can, but you can control it. You can control security groups. Okay. I would just Thank say be, be, be careful, but yes. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, when you do backup, uh, are you shutting down the instance, or are you doing, doing backup on the fly? So, so, so the question was, what happens? with backups, is the instance being shut down? It, so it's a, it's a good question. So it depends on the database type. True, it each, basically we take a backup. We don't take a volume snapshot or something like that. So different, we have different databases. And depending on the database itself, if the database supports a warm backup or hot backup, then, then it works that way. Sorry? So basically, we use a database technology. So if you take a look at a backup where it takes a look at the transaction log and whatever has been done has been stored into the backup, it will be consistent that way. So one, one thing to keep in mind, I didn't specifically say it out earlier, Trove does not rewrite any of the database functionality. So if you take a look at going back to MySQL, uh, so for MySQL, we, we out of the box, Trove uses Percona XRDB backup. But if you want to use, for example, MySQL dump, you can do that. There are things called strategies, and you can pick and choose what you want to do. We don't rewrite any of the database-specific code, because the database companies themselves have spent a lot of time and effort, so we, we kind of reuse them. So whatever behavior you would expect where you to do a Percona XRDB backup or a MySQL dump on a MySQL database is the same behavior you would see when you take a backup using Tro. Sorry, there was a question there. Yeah, yeah, just a question related to the uh, database engine. Mm -hmm. How do you maintain it up to date? So assuming that there is some patches to deploy on top to, sure. to address security breaches, for instance, mm -hmm. how do you do to maintain the engine always up to date? Is it, uh... So there, there, are, there, are, there are two parts to it, right? The, the Trove community itself provides the update upgrade mechanism I just talked about in Newton, where else, where if you have a new guest image, you have the ability to upgrade your running instance with new guest image. But Tesora, the company I work for, we, we provide regular updated guest images and we provide the tooling to upgrade it. But if you are going to use a community trove, you can use a trove functionality, but you will have to create up-to-date guest images and use that to keep your databases in sync with that. One second. Yeah, go ahead. Where is possible to test Trove? Why is the way for test it? So two ways. So the, the question was, how do you test Trove? There are two ways. If you, if you take the thumb drive I provide, it's got dev stack, open stack, and Trove already installed. You can just copy it into, into a laptop and test it out. Or if you have your own open stack available, you can either download it from the community, and you can deploy that. or if you, if, you want to, if you want something easier to do, you can come to our website. There's a, there's a free trial. You can download it, kick the tires, either way. Sorry. Uh, how is it possible to isolate the workload on the, on the computer? In terms of? Like uh, locking the instance to the specific Nova server or? Locking the? When you, I'm not sure I follow the question. So when you create a Trove instance, Trove automatically creates a Nova compute instance and put the database in there. It has an IP address associated to that, so that's what you use. But if, I, if I know that these servers are heavily used or there are neighbors who can, who can disturb, can I isolate that workload and move it to 
Yes. So you can, yes. So if you're talking about isolating instances, remember I talked about availability zones and hypervisors and things like that. You can take a look at, when you go to, if you are familiar with the OpenStack ecosystem, right, you can look at the dashboard and figure out which is being heavily used, which is not being heavily used. If you are, have a proper OpenStack with multiple hypervisors and you can look at what is available, you can pick and choose that availability zone or hypervisor in, or the compute and you can create your Nova instances there. there. But keep in mind, if you are talking about single instances or things like that, that's great, but if you're talking about clusters, you may want to spread them out and depending on how big your infrastructure is, sometimes you may have that clash, but it depends, it's a, it is a function of how much space and flexibility you have, yeah? There's a question at the back, yeah. Can Trove run on Ceph? Trove, okay, Trove uses Ceph. Trove runs on the OpenStack control plane, but Trove uses Cinder and Swift for storing the database data and storing the backups. And if you want to use, and basically Trove uses the public API for Cinder and Swift. So if you configure Ceph as your Cinder as well as Swift, Trove would work with that. Yes. Yeah, you can do that. That's something that's that's new. Um, back to the upgrade mm -hmm. um, story. Um, is there a strategy in terms of voice controller to either upgrade or to put a tail up of a database to do the whole thing online without you know taking down the VM, but actually all the space? Yeah, uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a good question. Right now, we are we are look at the the community. When I say we. The community is looking into it, but right now what happens is Nova has got a functionality called Nova Rebuild. So basically you can take a VM and put a new VM in there. So what happens is that we use that functionality to put a, create a new instance based on an image, and we don't touch the data. But when you bring it up, there is downtime. The actual downtime per database, if you will, is limited to how much time it takes to bring it up. So it's pretty fast, but today, you're right. Today, because we use it that way, there is a downtime. Okay. So we probably have two to three more questions. I'm available to talk outside, I guess. The next person will have to come in there. So there, is, there are two questions. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. OK. So the, the, the question was, how do you do monitoring? So there is no module per se. It is a functionality within Trove called module management. And there is documentation that basically specifies how do you create a plugin for the monitoring tool of your choice. Let's say you want to use New Relic or Nagios or a Collect D or whatever it is that you want to do, or Oracle Enterprise Manager, right, if you want to use Oracle. So you basically create a plugin using the Trove documentation and use the module management API to, to load it in. It's pretty straightforward. Yeah. Um, what is the upgrade path for the control plane of Trove? So if I want to go from Ithaca to Newton or from Newton to Ithaca, is it disruptive or is it non-disruptive for the instances? It is, it is non-disruptive for the instances, but when the Trove itself upgrades, uh, keep in mind the instances are basically your MySQL 5, 6 or something like that. As long as the next one supports it, it's good. So um, there are two ways. I mean, if you use the community trove, then you will be upgrading it as part of uh, the OpenStack itself. But what we have done, it's not a plug for my company just to give a compare and contrast. What we have done is we found that Upgrading OpenStack is complicated. It takes a long of, and a number of our customers have chosen to jump over one OpenStack release because of the time and effort. So we have made sure every release that we put, and we put roughly three to four releases a year, is backwards compatible all the way to Juno. So in your case, if you are in Juno, Kilo, Liberty, Bitaka, whatever it is, you can use the latest and greatest Tro and from Tesora. And what happens is that when you upgrade, we provide upgrade scripts. You can just run those upgrade scripts, and obviously there's a downtime during that time, but once your control plane is up, your instances are, are available. So you said that you made sure that the instances and the APIs and everything is back 
guess the, the, the guess that you carry is it yeah. forward compatible with the, the conductor? Yeah. Sorry, you're 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 saying. Oh, he was just asking about the instances. It is that's controlled by nobody. Yeah. You upgrade the control plane. Control plane. Exactly. So, do we have time for one or two more questions, or do we need to close? No. Okay. So, I'm available. I can be available outside, or I'm also available um, at the booth, and you can do. It. Oh, thank you. Thank you.